Detroit will welcome everyone and thank you again for coming out to another Penn Live Reader panel. I am Joyce Davis, for those of you who don't know, and I am the opinion page editor for Penn Live. We are going to talk about today a topic that I think is a little controversial, but one that I think we all need to kind of sink our teeth into, and that is the issue of religious tolerance in our society. And of course, I don't have to tell you this is all sparked by the recent controversy that took place in the state legislature when a, a devout Christian stood up and gave a prayer uh, that many people thought was over the top, to put it. They thought that in considering it was a public square and considering there were people of different faiths, perhaps it went too far. But that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, issues of freedom of speech, issues of freedom of religion, issues of the public square. So with that, again, I thank you for coming, and we're going to step into what the first question is that I'm going to throw out at you, and I'm going to ask any of you who wants to start off to simply do so. You'll have to wait for the microphone. And our first question is a simple one. Do you think we have a problem with religious intolerance religious bigotry in our region. Corky's going to start us off. Excellent. Corky goes there. <clears throat> yes, I do. I think that all of us have been given a sacred trust when we came here from a generation ahead. And there always has been anti-Semitism on Jewish and uh, certainly uh, not as much as it is now. So I think we do have a problem, and also in the Muslim community. Um, I, my position is that I think it has gotten much worse. I think the uh, white supremacists, the white nationalists, uh, the people who are in the White House, I think some comments that President Trump has made and some actions have brought people out of the shadows who generally wouldn't feel a comfort level of saying some of the things that they have said. And I just saw on YouTube today, there's a trial going on, and on YouTube I saw the most horrible racial things you could see. So I definitely think there is a problem, and I think we just have to try and work together and recognize that. And uh, I'm very worried about, not myself, but my children, my grandchildren, and everybody's grandchildren, because I think we should be giving them the kind of world that we inherited, and that's why. Okay. Well, let's hear Azra. Azra, I think, is Azra Syed, who's here for all, only herself. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, religious intolerance has been a fabric of the American society for a very long time. You saw a religious intolerance against the, um, the Catholics and the Jews and the Chinese, you know. But, um, it seemed to have simmered down a little bit. It, like, uh, like what Corky said, maybe it wasn't so much out in the open, but with recent events, I know, uh, I guess especially with the Muslim community, um, I think up until 1979 with the Iran war, until that time, it wasn't as apparent. You would hear, say, an occasional breaking into a mosque, not, for, not as a hate crime, but just some you know, just a theft or something like that. But after 79, those feelings became a little more uh, intense against the Muslims. But at that time, what we found out was that people didn't really know enough about the Islamic religion. And then it went up, and then came 9-11. And then we saw a surge in, uh, you know, hate crimes against the Muslims. And then again, it seemed to have simmered down a little bit with uh, Barack Obama's, you know, until the election time, when there were rumors going on that he was a Muslim. That's when we saw another upsurge. And then again, you know, it is at its worst now with the Trump administration. And when you have people in high places, in, you know, like in powerful places making statements like uh, that Islam is uh, a cancer, and, you know, you can't expect too much anything better from the general public. Right. So, you know, this started off being a conversation about Islamophobia, but thanks to Saeed O'Nal, he says, no, this needs to be expanded. We need to really have all faiths talking about it because 
it seems to be a problem for everyone. Um, in fact, I know <laughs> we recently had a problem with the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, right? That maybe Rabbi uh, Murov would like to comment on that. About a year ago, I had the privilege of uh, chaperoning a group of Harrisburg young people to uh, Auschwitz. And watching these young people, uh, with hundreds of thousands of other young people from around the world, walk through the, the, the gates of Auschwitz and walk on those grounds where so many people suffered and so many millions of people died. Uh, you could see in their faces uh, the impact that that experience had. And, um, and, and for, I guess, two generations now, Jews around the world have said never again. And when the attack took place in Pittsburgh, it really shook many of us to our core. Uh, while certainly anti-Semitism has been around for maybe as long as America's been around, uh, you know, the killing of 11 people whose only crime, as it were, was, was attending synagogue services really uh, made all of us, makes all of us feel very vulnerable. I mean, and do you think it's increasing? I, I do. I mean, uh, the statistics, I, I, I don't think we should be relying on anecdotal evidence yeah. alone. I mean, if, you, if you go to the Anti-Defamation -Defamation League website, you'll, you'll see uh, the, the numbers of anti-Semitic attacks have increased. And um, yeah, while I have the mic, but I'll, I'll simply say that uh, our tradition teaches that every single person was created in God's image. I'm not saying we all have to believe that, but it's a really powerful idea that inside each human being is a spark of the divine. And, and I think that unless and until we parents teach our kids to respect the dignity of every human being, then we'll continue to have, uh, have violence against other people, hatred towards other people, hatred towards other people. And so looking around this circle, as diverse as it is, it gives me hope that we, that we see each other as human beings first and whatever our nationality or ethnic group uh, is the same. I think, we'll go ahead, Sayyid then Benzad. Yeah, I would like to add to uh, the increase. You know, first, I definitely agree it does exist. Um, but it, does it increase over the time, recent events? Yes. I'll just give you an example. Uh, a good friend of mine from South, um, a good friend of him from work, um, retired since then. On Facebook, we're friends, and, and he made a posting that was very really offensive against Muslims, you know, referring to the congresswoman, Muslim congresswoman. And, and the, 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 the posting was against all Muslims, not for her specifically. And I said, I know him for 15 years. I said, you know I'm Muslim, and I love this country as much as you do, and I don't think this is fair what you just said. I don't agree with this, and it didn't look good on you. He apologized. I said, Said, I didn't mean you. <laughs> but his friends attacked me for days, saying that if you don't like it, leave this country. I lived in the United States more than I lived in my home where I was born. And Lord, where was that? In Turkey. Turkey. <laughs> so I'm a US citizen. Um, that I have never witnessed. Something that anger, just saying that this is not fair. People are saying things that I never seen that before. So it definitely increased uh, whoever and whatever is causing this, we need to find a solution to it. Well, let, let's talk. I mean, I know some other people want to talk, so why don't we let this show in then Azra? We'll just bring it over to Azra. Oh, Atika. Atika, sorry. <laughs> I've read a recent statistic that 85% of the wars in the world through history have been caused over religion. And I think it comes down to not necessarily whole groups. I don't want to label a whole group, but there are individuals who, because they believe that their religion is the one and only, they think it's okay to insult verbally, physically, people that don't agree with them. And the more we can get all the groups to understand that you're allowed to believe what you want to believe, as long as you're not hurting somebody, you want to believe in the tooth fairy, it's okay. But actually, the more you learn, about the other religions. My neighborhood has, has uh, become a lot of immigrants from um, from Bhutan and Nepal. Mm -hmm. And sitting down and talking with them and learning about their religion, wonderful people, absolutely wonderful. I've attended their house blessings, I've attended their weddings, really, really good people. We need to cross over and see, you know, 
for real and safe. Yeah. But you you know, you said something as long as you're not attacking or hurting someone else. So but that gets us to the point, like even in this prayer, it really wasn't attacking anyone. It was just fervently oh, yeah. saying what you believe. But Should was, that have caused us so much of anxiety? Well, she was verbally imposing her belief on others when the prayer should have been much more general. And I think that's what caused the problem. Okay, Anika, and then we'll go to the Christian <laughs> the Episcopal <laughs> priest back there. Okay. Yes, um, so there is definitely a rise in religious intolerance and the FBI statistics. Uh, are a concrete proof. Um, in the past three years, 17% rise increase has been uh, observed, and 37% um, of that against the Jewish communities, and 20% uh, approximately against the Muslim communities. So yes, the statistics do back up that claim that um, there has been a significant rise. Uh, now, previously the Muslim community experienced that after 9-11. And as our friend said, that it uh, kind of dwindled after a few years, but uh, it didn't go anywhere. It was still very much bubbling beneath the surface. We were and still are the boogeyman. Uh, what has happened now is that we have a person in the White House who has clearly declared that Islam hates us as in America or uh, those who are not Muslims. And then there are other people who um, agree or just um, support those claims of his. So when you have a leader that the world looks to, you know, America is not, it does not function in isolation. The entire world looks and learns from America. And as we all witnessed uh, from the attacks in New Zealand, that uh, the, the terrorist invoked Trump's name right, and his ideology, and he said that he is doing this for the common cause. So this is what happens when you spread hateful, fearful rhetoric around, and when you normalize that kind of hatred. And as far as the, the prayer is concerned, there is nothing wrong with praying in public, although uh, when it comes to the house of government, you have to realize that the house of government is not the house of worship. So you have to be very, very careful. The establishment clause what it was put in place to erect a wall between uh, church and state. And it is there for a reason so that uh, the one group that is uh, a majority does not impose its religion or religious beliefs on those who do not adhere to that belief. And it's, it wasn't just um, inappropriate for the Muslims, particularly uh, uh, the Muslim uh, representative who was sworn in, it was an insult to those who do not follow any faith or be who belong to any other faith. So um, what was said was not just uh, a usual prayer. It was targeted toward insulting. You think it actually happened because the first Muslim legislator was going to be sworn in that day? Yes, and it was more of a political statement. It was as a lot of people have uh, said, weaponized. Well, let, let's let the Reverend talk. It's not hard to find people who will say this is a Christian nation, right? Yeah, I think that's one of the big issues. Um, I've spent a lot of my life, both before being a priest and now, really in looking at white supremacy and systemic racism. So when we talk about our own faith traditions, I think, you know, I personally have to look at the Christian faith tradition. I have to look at the history of the Episcopal Church, uh, its own history as well as its history in connection with the country. And unfortunately, you know, white supremacy has been closely aligned with Christianity at particular times. And so, you know, I found it so <coughs> horrifying at times when, um, like in Charlottesville, and you see white nationalists who proclaim to be following God, or like when I went to the rally before Election Day at the state capitol of the white nationalists, and um, 
you know, you, you see that connection. So, I mean, I have to understand that history so that if I'm going to say a prayer in a public place, which I do get asked to do fairly frequently, I remember that history that sometimes Christianity was perverted to be oppressive. And I have to understand that history about Christianity so that I don't keep replicating that pattern of oppression because to me that's not who Jesus right. Christ was. But see, that's interesting that you have said Christianity has been perverted because that's not the teaching, which is exactly what our Muslim <coughs> friends say about the people who claim to be jihadis mm -hmm. who pervert Islam, but we don't have the ability to, <laughs> to draw those parallels, it seems, sometimes. But yes, go ahead. Back here. Dorothy. And I, yes, and I think that uh, people who say that this was a Christian country misunderstand what the Bill of Rights is about. The people who were establishing this were, were creatures of the Enlightenment. They believed that, that there was a great danger in religion connected with government, which is why they said no. We're not going to have hundred year wars the way they did in Europe over religion. We're going to separate religion and the government because everyone should have an equal chance in this country. It's something new. It's not something old that we were trying to do. And I think that that is the background, not a Christian background, but uh, an Enlightenment background that began America. Okay. I, let, let's let Mark come in here because one of the things, Mark, that I know you're going to address, and, and, and rightfully so, is whether we're really being fair to President Trump. Um, uh, as someone said, this has existed in our society for a very, 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 very long time. But yet people keep do raise the issue of the rhetoric that seems to come from the White House. What are your thoughts on that? Oh boy, well I was going to address the establishment <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, issue okay. and I will respectfully disagree with my colleagues that the establishment clause does not create a wall of separation between church and state. The establishment clause says the federal government cannot establish a state church. The individual states all had state churches. Nine of the 13 original colonies all had a state-sponsored Christian church and the Constitution did not abolish that. In fact, the states, the last state's official state church went away in about 1820, 1830. So I don't think it's correct to say that uh, the Establishment Clause prevents any, any state-sponsored uh, uh, faith or church. It's just not legally correct, in my view. Um, with regard to President Trump, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I'll just say overall, I think that uh, America historically has been one of the most tolerant nations for peoples of various faiths throughout the history of the world. Uh, I'm thinking, I, I can't think of uh, any, uh, any pogroms that occurred in the United States. I can't think of any religious-based wars that occur here. I can think of religious-based wars that occur in just about every other part of the world from the dawn of time to current day. So I think that uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists uh, do much better here in America and have historically uh, than they have in many other parts uh, of the world. And that, I don't think there's a disagreement with that, but I guess, and I'll let them ask, the question though is what are we facing now? It's not all about war. But there are clearly some problems if people are dying in churches, synagogues, and mosques yes. around the nation. Did, who, who hasn't had a chance to talk? This gentleman here. <laughs> okay. And then we'll pass it around. I think that whether President Trump is to be uh, blamed for this or not, he's offered a platform yeah. for people to espouse their views, um, rightly or wrongly. And it's become, maybe we've become more tolerant, uh, unfortunately, become more tolerant of what people are doing, or we don't care. You mean more tolerant of it's, we're not, offensive um, behavior? Yes, yes. Okay. More, more tolerant of offensive behavior. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll attribute this to Abraham Lincoln, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm right. 
I believe he said that silence is one of the greatest enemies we have. And what most of the people here have said are two things. Education, knowing what the religion is and what this panel is doing, talking about it and letting people know and trying to get them to come together. Unfortunately, we're always going to have intolerance in the world. We're human beings. It's human nature. But the more that we can come together and, and get different faiths together and let people understand what the faiths are, whether we call, if we believe in a supreme being, whether we call him Jesus or God or Allah or Buddha or whatever, it's still a supreme being. And we all pray to that one person. And if we can understand that it's really one God, regardless of the name, that's, I think, a big part of the education. Mm -hmm. Parker, did you want to? <coughs> I, I just had to put in here a little bit, Mark. I kind of disagree with you about the groms. I would point to the Carlisle Indian School, mm -hmm. right up, right down the road here, where Native children were pulled from their communities and their culture was totally taken away from them to be Christian. So the Christianity has quite a history in this country, of, um, even in the West, which I don't know as much, but when the Spaniards came in. So I just have to, I just have to sort of clarify that since yeah. Carlisle. But that was also was a perversion. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. what I'm saying is it's right, right down yes. the And you may not sure. call it war, but it was we have to. We have to wait for the microphone or it's yeah. not going to be. No, let's let I Parker go. You want it to go Some, yeah. for a while. That's okay. She uh, I'll bring her back. Yeah. Okay. Bring give it back. to Parker. Yes, and then we'll go back to <laughs> Samia. I just wanted to say that I agree with Orlando and many other people on this panel here in saying that the main problem, at least in this modern age, is that there's a gross misunderstanding and misrepresentation of our fellow neighbor in the sense that nobody, or at least the majority of Americans, don't even know the basic tenets and basic beliefs of many other faiths other than their own. I think that is one of the They may problems. not know their own. <laughs> exactly. I think that one of the main things we need to address here is just, well, I'd like to say religious literacy, but in the sense that even just understanding what your friend or your other family member or more partner believes in that, what we see on TV and what we see in the news is just the radicals of any faith, both Christian, Muslim, Jewish, anyone, is that not everyone, not anyone that's sitting, not anyone that's sitting next to you believes in those same things as those who are fighting on television. And Parker, is, that's his field. He's in, a senior in high school, but is devoted to learning about other faiths. Yes? Uh, definitely, we agree. I think most of us do that this is the best country in the world. It's the fairest country in the world. Nobody argues that, I don't think. Uh, but we can make this even better place. That's the purpose of this, right? And facts have shown that it's not just a regrettable reaction to a bad deed done by an evil Muslim person. It is Islamophobia follows when there is an election year. It's politics. It's a politics of fear. That's when it rises. Acts of uh, Islamophobia rises when there's politics involved. It's a fear of politics. There's also a multi-million dollar industry that does this fear mongering. And I'm sorry to say this, media doesn't help us either. That's why we're trying to help now. <laughs> right. And, right. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, about the prayer, um, it is not just about the prayer being disrespectful to others. Twelve legislators walked, walked out, out of the, yes. before she could swear in. Yes. What do you call that? So it was a protest. I just wanted to say, to clarify, uh, white supremacy, white nationalist, when you have a man like Steve Bannon, who definitely, and no one, I hope no one here can disagree, is a white supremacist. He speaks, I've, I've watched him, I've, I've read his stuff on all right, I've read all that. He's in the White House as a special advisor to the president, and now he's out. But Stephen Miller is there, mm -hmm. and Stephen Miller is a white nationalist. And yes, Stephen Miller comes from a Jewish home. But that doesn't mean he can't be what he is. He is the one pushing the entire immigration reform right now. Stephen Miller, and he's right there in the White House, and he was on television just the other night talking about this. So I believe that when you see these people so close to the presidency of the United States, as I said before, 
this gives that comfort level mm -hmm. to people to come out from under their rocks and the shadows and say and feel comfortable saying things because white supremacy white nationalists people can disagree Muslims Jewish people and others do not have a place with the white nationalists or white supremacy. They want us right. out of the country, right. and they want this to be their country. So let's let uh, uh, Beth on, and then we'll let Mark talk, and then we'll go up to Azra. As a Baha'i, I look at it from different perspective, like looking from inside out, from outside in. Uh, a lot of people, or majority of the people in this country especially they don't know anything about any other religions. And then I heard with my own ears, because I have many different friends, the way they talk about other religions are very, very offensive. And then also religious leaders, some of them, not all of them, they also, the way they present other religions to their community is very, very devastating. And actually to the point of enticing them so I think if we wanted to do something, our leadership, both in political arena and religious, they should become much more uh, indoctrinated to the point that they should not use the religion to promote their own or raise people against another. When they do that, you know, then we'll be subsiding and we'll become more civil with each other to the point that we can sit around the table and eat from the same bowl. Okay. You want to go and then I'll go to Mark? Yes, uh, I just wanted to add to how the media plays a part in uh, shaping public opinion. I'll give you two examples. Uh, there was this um, uh, a party leader, you know, um, he was a political party leader from the Netherlands who converted to Islam. And before that, he, was, he belonged to that very extreme right wing party. They were uh, putting out cartoons and things about, you know, mm. anti-Islamic activities. So he actually made a statement that it was the party policy to pin everything that was bad on the Muslims, just to create a bad name. And he said, you know, there was so, there was so much evil that was going on that he decided he wanted to take a closer look, a first-hand look at what Islam was all about. He went ahead, he read you know, the books and everything, and eventually decided to become a Muslim. And this was just like beginning, uh, at, uh, maybe the end of last year or beginning of uh, this year. Then the second example is right here from Illinois. There was this gentleman who was so brainwashed listening to what was happening in the media against the Muslims, this, that. He decided he wanted to go and bomb a few mosques, so he had chalked out. And this gentleman actually appeared on CNN. Um, he said he had chalked out you know, a few mosques that he was going to bomb. And he walked into one of them one day just to see, you know, to, to see the layout of the place and all that. He went back home, and then he said a few days later, his little uh, elementary school going the daughter came back, and she was talking about this young girl who was new in the school, and she was wearing a headscarf and a long dress and all and he figured that that must be a Muslim girl. So he said that actually touched his heart. Mm -hmm. He said if I, and you know, the little girl had nothing but praise for this other Muslim right. girl, you know. So that, he, he started, that changed his mind. And eventually he said, I went into the mosque, I asked for material to read, and then he decided to convert, and now he is the imam of that. Oh, wow, that's a story. So, okay. so, so media can really play a big role in changing opinions and minds. That's true. So Let's let Mark. Oh. I need to leave. Can I, can I just say one thing? Yes, go right go. ahead. Mark, yeah. I apologize. That's fine. Um, you know, we, we need to broaden the number of people who are having conversations like this. I, I want to welcome people to come to our congregation to visit, as other people have said, just getting to know each other as people. Uh, to hear what you experienced of, of somebody telling you you don't have a place in this country because you're calling out a friend of yours for making a uh, gross generalization about all, uh, all Muslims. It has to stop. So it's an interesting discussion, but unless and until we actually broaden the scope of the discussion, 
we'll just leave here feeling like, well, we had a nice evening. Uh, but I, but I really think that the Patriot News can be a partner, and life can be a partner with the religious community and other people from yeah. across the political and religious spectrum to to really engage people in a conversation, to really get to know each other personally, so that um, because because lives are on the line. Yes. What happened in Pittsburgh? What happened in New Zealand? Exactly. Could happen right here in Harrisburg. Exactly. God but, forbid. but here's the problem, Rabbi. The problem is only people who are willing to dialogue will show up at some. Those who have closed minds are not going to come. So the role we're trying to play is, they might watch this on YouTube, yeah, yeah. right? They might look at it and perhaps someone will be changed. And who but to get, people yeah. who, to get people are here who really are the other extreme, there's, there's no way to do well, it. You can't change every nice. single mind, but yeah. Azra, uh, you. you need the microphone for anything. Okay. Okay. Yes. A couple of quick uh, points. I'll defend my honor as a history major. There were no religious pogroms in the United States of America. The, our founding fathers and our forefathers absolutely moved the indigenous peoples west and then off the edge of the continent. No question about that. But it wasn't a religious war. It was a war for territory. We threw the British out of America. They were all Christian. That wasn't a religious war. We shot and killed the Spanish who were manning the garrisons in Florida and got the Spain out of Florida. They're 100% Christian. No religious pogroms in the United States of America historically and today. I've heard a lot about white nationalism and white supremacy. Uh, President Trump is not a white supremacist or a white nationalist. He doesn't believe the white race is superior to the other races around the world. He's not a white nationalist. He doesn't want to create a white ethno state in the United States of America. Nothing he has ever said or done has anything to do with those extreme policies of a few white nationalist groups. America is in a much better place. Remember when we had white supremacy and white nationalism, white when half the country <laughs> yeah, sorry, was sorry. enslaved, when we had yeah. slavery, legal slavery, we had segregation. That's real racism. That's real white supremacy. That's real white nationalism. We fought a civil war. We've talked about that. Right. Um, hundreds of thousands of Americans lost their lives trying to destroy slavery and Jim Crow and segregation. So America's doing, I think, very well, historically speaking, against its own history. And lastly, I've heard a couple of references to 9-11. I just wonder if any of my colleagues think that the attackers on 9-11, the attackers in Orlando, Boston, San Bernardino, and, and, and the others, were those acts of religious intolerance versus Christians? Oh, yeah, well, but, but let me, before we go into that, I'll, I'll get, how do you, though, I mean, I know you're, you, you know, I hear what you're saying, that you don't believe the president's a racist, and, but, but how do you explain having those kinds of people with the, around him as advisors? How, What's the explanation? Yeah, they're, they're not. They're, they're, okay. just, they're, they're not. just not. And, and the way forward is when President Trump says that people in Virginia who oppose taking down a statue of Thomas Jefferson, when President Trump lauds those people because they think that Thomas Jefferson was a pretty good guy, he was our third president, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was a great American. When people come together to say, hey, let's not take down his statue, and Trump lauds and applauds those people, and when the media turns that in to something entirely different, and they say that President Trump was supporting white nationalists and white extremists, which is entirely false. The president condemned white nationalism and white extremism, I think, five or six times in the same speech. But we're not going to move this country forward. If you come to me and say, Mark, you oppose taking down Monticello. You oppose taking down the Washington Monument. You oppose taking down Mount Vernon. Because you do so, you're a white nationalist. If that's your position, we're never going to improve race and, relations and I think this in this is, country. This is, a point, this is a good point. We have to be willing to hear each other, mm -hmm. right? Even things that we disagree with, with civility. So thank you for sharing that. Do you want to go? All right. Yeah, I really, really disagree about the fact that white supremacy has disappeared. 
because I think most statistics bear it out that the lighter your skin is, the more economic power you have, the more chances yeah. you have, you get lower mortgage rates. I mean, you can look at any statistic um, and see that there is a preference for people who are so-called labeled as white, like me. So I need to understand that that's the case. Um, because that, I have to be aware of, of, of that to walk in this world and to be respectful of other people. And I think it is complicated as far as Thomas Jefferson. I took my grandchildren to Monticello. I took them to Mount Vernon. We did the slave tour at Mount Vernon. It, it, it's pretty complicated. I agree because there were really wonderful things that came out of this people, out of, out of these people. But at the same time, a lot of that was made possible because they enslaved people. You know, like, I just think we have to own our history and own our part. And so I have to be aware all the time that I'm walking through the world as a person who's perceived as white. And that gives me particular opportunities that not everybody has. Okay. And it has Agreed. But let, let's do this. Let's refocus it now. Because when we talk about religious intolerance, which is where our conversation was, mm -hmm. right? That can be black people too. Right. <laughs> right. It can so, be people yeah. of color yeah. who are religiously intolerant, mm -hmm. right? So let's let's circle back around here and let, let me just ask you this, just in general. Mm -hmm. Did we have a problem with Representative Stephanie Borowitz's prayer? Did you have a problem with that? Yes. It was too long. <laughs> it was you didn't have a problem with the content. You just when I mean honestly, did you? It was just long. Well, because you're she, representing when another view here. When she veered into politics, right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I do have a. It was long, uh, but I, I didn't appreciate her veering into politics, and she started talking about U.S.-Israeli relations, which really should have no place in a prayer. Um, and um, I think the next day, though, I think um, we heard a prayer uh, from a member of uh, the Islamic faith, and I think that was very well received. So I think we have to be tolerant and we have to allow people to pray publicly in the manner in which they choose. We may say it's too long, we may say, ah, don't get into politics, but those, you know, we're kind of nipping at the edges there. That, that there is a, a First Amendment right to free speech. You do have the right to express your faith in a public forum, no question about that legally and constitutionally. Uh, so if we're going to continue to nitpick at this uh, prayer that this representative gave and condemn it and say it's intolerant we're not going to move we're not going to move the ball forward to a more tolerant inclusive society Go ahead. yeah so um, just to uh, get it out in the open we or you know most people here do not have a problem with prayer with public prayer uh, I don't think that is the problem the problem was the content of the prayer and um, again, so it's, it was not that she invoked Jesus' name 13 times during that prayer. It was that she also invoked Trump's name along with Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. What was that? That was a political statement, basically. Yeah, but let's, let's be honest here. Also, if we had to wait. If we had given a prayer a few years back and we had saying, God bless Obama, Nobody would have had a problem with that, No, right? see, that's the thing. We would have a problem. The okay. problem is, is, is when you, again, you politicize the prayer, that's when the problem arises. And she did not stop there. You can have a very um, secular kind of a prayer as well that applies to everyone that serves as an inspiration. But when there were words, uh, phrases used like every knee, would then, <laughs> yeah, in every <laughs> tongue, tongue confess. Yes, I've heard it so before. Yes, so that uh, yeah. kind of puts all the people uh, who belong to other faiths, as well as who don't claim to have any faith, in kind of a very uh, tough spot. Mm -hmm. And that's what was uh, being criticized. Okay, best thought, and then sure. we'll go to park. Uh, uh, go to Azran and Park. It's a good, lively discussion. Yes. So, but prayer as we look at it as Baha'is, it's a conversation with the Creator. Conversation, that means a two-way talk, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not just talk and listen, so. And then also it means that when we have a conversation, we listen also. Mm -hmm. 
And the prayer is really showing our gratitude to our Creator. So if the prayer, it doesn't matter where you say it, public place or private place, if that's the prayer, then you should be all right. So definitely we should take a lesson on what the prayer is mm -hmm. so we can address our Creator in likewise, same manner. And then if you have an issue with somebody, take it to another room or another place. Because prayer is not to attack another person because you are attacking your own Creator. I just want to give you an example of how the wrong choice of words can affect, you know, how people think. Some years ago, when we bought this, uh, the lost in Steelton, there was a big sign out there which said, there's no other God but Allah. And Allah is just another, the Arabic word for God. There was such a lot of um, uproar, you know, by the local communities there. They had us remove that sign, and then we had to put a more generalized board. So we learned our lesson that, you know, feelings can be hurt very easily. Who by told you to remove us. the sign, though? Well, people were being, you know, like we were getting letters. Okay, uh, so no one forced you to remove it. You no. just thought you know, it was... I, I okay. think, I'm not sure, maybe Samia, you would remember. That maybe somebody from the local council or somebody said that, you know, in order to calm everybody down, you know, just uh, remove that and put a more generalized. So uh, really, it's it all depends on how people are going to react. And also the timing, you know, regarding the prayer. Uh, I think maybe the timing was wrong, because if it hadn't been just during the time <coughs> of the swearing in of a Muslim woman, yes, maybe the reaction yeah. may not have been as bad, you know. And then so also Parker, talking, may I just take yeah, one ahead. minute? Your uh, question about 9-11 and what, whether that those attacks were religiously motivated? No, were they acts of religious intolerance toward Christians? Intolerance. I don't think so. Okay. Because I, I think for a, you know, a normal, some of my friends that I talk to, Americans, they belong to different faiths. They really don't care whether I go to the mosque five times a day or I go to the church. You know, whichever denomination I follow, they believe that you know, the, it's the a path to the same destination. Right. Well, but there are probably other factors that are making them. They are just using religion as an excuse. Now, what those other factors are, I'm still trying to figure out. Are they economic? Uh, is it fear of? Well, you're saying the 9/11 attacks were not gonna, religiously motivated. No. Against Americans. Against Americans. No. Against Christians. The, no, no. They were against. Okay. Americans or Americans or Christians already. If we're not on the microphone, we're, we're not, not going to be heard. Yeah. Okay, so now we, you, did you want to say something? Okay, uh, Parker, I will say this. I might disagree with you on that. Having studied and done a lot of research into the terrorists, religion was definitely one of the issues it's from my research, and I've been to speak to them. But it wasn't the only one. But you it don't was have the mic. Politics. <laughs> <laughs> it was politics. It was um, economics. It was the whole history thing. So it's a bunch of stuff. You know, Joyce, none of them were. Wait. You have <laughs> I just wanted to say that I lived, I lived, I was born and raised in the city of Harrisburg. And I live at, uh, my side of my house faces Division Street and the front face is Italian Lake. And I have been living there with my wife and raised our children for 45 years. Now there was a church right across the street, the Lakeside Lutheran Church. It was sold uh, to uh, the Muslim community. And I will tell you this, that those people there are so terrific. They have reached out to the community during the snow to help uh, shovel the snow to help some of the elderly people and I have been there and uh, I think that was a great lesson for many people uptown to see the how we can react together and it was a very good way to do that and I think the church up there uh, the Muslim uh, mosque there is no problem right. uptown with that Muslim because we reach out all right, so yeah, and, and it is important, I mean, to go a little bit deeper. I'm going to take it a little bit deeper. Uh, because that group of Muslims, 
is persecuted in the Muslim world. They are not considered mainstream. Mm -hmm. So we should be aware of those things. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have a representative of the Ahmadiyya movement here uh, because frequently they, the two groups do not mix. So we should <coughs> keep that in our minds because sometimes we don't understand those differences. Go ahead. Uh, I will never deny the fact that there are bad Muslims doing evil, horrific things to either Christians, Americans, or whatever have you. Definitely they are. I'm not going to deny that. Okay, having said that, um, not, our problems are not just our problems. There is also the African American community that has gone through much worse than we all put together can face. And uh, the, who says slave, uh, slavery is done? I feel slavery is still going on. Look at our prisons. Mm -hmm. Look at our prisons. Parker had question. an issue, a question on the religious aspect. Parker? So, um, first, I do want to address the 9 11 question. I mean, at least to my understanding, it is, it is all three, it, is, it was from religious reasons, political reasons, and also just the so culture sure. between the East and West. I do believe that it's all three of those. And, well, getting to the issue of prayer, I do not condemn her prayer, nor, but nor do I condone her prayer in the sense that I think that it was inappropriate and I almost want to say in poor taste just because I think she should have been more aware of the situation she was in and that in that kind of public setting that she should have had language that was not as aggressive and like listening to it, prayer is supposed to inspire and prayer is supposed mm -hmm. to uplift. I didn't necessarily feel those things personally and I was Christian, I was raised in a strong faith-based network, but I personally think that she went a little bit too far and her language was much too, she ostracized everyone around her. But I do not think that she, that prayer should not be allowed, I think that it should be allowed in public spaces, but it should, it should definitely be, um, there should be more mindfulness when it comes to more prayers <laughs> in society. Okay. Okay. Saeed after the reverend. Um, I, I just wanted to say that when we're talking about tolerance and how do we deal with this. So one of the issues in the Episcopal Church is that we are very open and welcoming to people who are LGBTQ. But not every Christian denomination believes that. There's great upheaval in many. And, and so I, while I understand where people are coming from, like I understand this faith, um, this group of Christianity who just has this urgency about converting everybody because it's a really strong belief that if you do not follow Jesus Christ, you are a lost soul. I understand that that is an urgency. I understand this urgency that says, you know, people who are LGBTQ and many religions are considered just evil people. So I know that's out there. At the same time, I have to vehemently oppose it and say that my experience, my reading, my denomination's experience and study of this comes to a very different conclusion. And as someone said, I'm the one at the end of my life that has to face my maker, has to face my God and say, this is what I did. And if, if, if I say that the root of my faith is love, how do I explain that I hated and was cruel to any group of people? But there are those tensions. And so I think the hardest thing for me is figuring out where is the line? Where's the line where there is civil discourse you know, when a neighbor put a Confederate flag out front on their private property, I did go tell them how I felt about that. That I did not like seeing that, that I thought it conveyed a very poor message. It was not about history, not in Perry County. We fought for the Union. Um, they took the flag down. I mean, like, there's just a line where I think you have to say, this is how I feel. I mean, I think I was very respectful. But there's certain lines that cannot be crossed, and I think figuring out where those are and how to do that is a challenge. Okay, Saeed, and then we're going to come to a conclusion. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joyce. Um, what I'd like to say about the cause of all these problems is in the, in the society we live in. Yes, I agree, America is a great country, and it happens to attract a lot of people, talented, smart, educated people, wanting to come to Western world especially in America. There is a reason for that. Those who think excluding people, putting walls, and, and discriminating against, if they are thinking they're making, doing a favor to America, 
they are actually heard in America. What attracts people, the inclusiveness, the openness, religious tolerance, this is why people want to come be part of this great society. History teaches us a lot of big empires went down the flames because they lost their touch with tolerance and inclusiveness. Ottoman Empire is one of them. Now, Ottoman Empire is where my cultural ties come from. They were great at once, but when they were great, they were great because they included everybody. Mm -hmm. They opened their doors to, to uh, Jewish people from Spain because they were being burned down there. There was no religious tolerance in Europe. So people of Jewish faith came with the guest invite of the Ottoman Sultan. But when the Ottomans start going down, that religious tolerance was, and cultural tolerance, was no longer part of the society. So even Arabs that we shared the religion, they fought against the Ottomans. They left us. So to stay great, we have to focus on how to beat that fear. I understand there is a fear of unknown. We have to open the dialogue environment. Everybody needs to talk to each other. Nobody is more in one thing than others. Everybody who either participate in the righteousness and, and being right, respecting others, or they are fearful about losing their privileges. They're losing something. So if we can open this up and talk to each other, we can continue making America, continue making America great because it's already a great country, because that's why all these people. Now you look down all the immigration channels. Most Eastern countries, Muslim, Indian, Buddhist, whatever, right? Because they're running away from their own land, not because there's not resources there. It's because there's no tolerance. So this is what I, I think is the main problem. And to cure that, I think, I, my suggestion is people should, should travel. You know, I found in my 25, 26 years in America, I found this. Uh, people who went to another country, even for military reason, they went to Vietnam to fight. But they came back with more openness, tolerant for other people. So whatever reason, I, don't, I, I hope nobody goes to fight another country. But, but we need to go visit. Maybe start with your neighbor. You know, if, if you know someone that doesn't look like you, maybe you should knock their door and, and, and say, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything we can do together? Maybe you invite them over for, for a tea. So I think that starts with that open dialogue. And then finally, maybe visit another country that will help. Thank you. Well, you've, you've actually taken us to the conclusion. Because my conclusion was to get a, a few ideas about, so where do we go from here? We, unfortunately, we can't say we've seen the end of deaths due to religious intolerance, right? But are there steps we can take? Are there steps faith leaders can take to try to create an atmosphere in our society that does not encourage viciousness, that does not encourage violence against someone who's different? Yes. Who has the microphone? Okay, oh, behind right you. Here. Okay. I would just say, living in Harrisburg and being brought up at Ohev Shalom Temple at Front and Seneca, where there was a great rabbi, Rabbi Bookstaber, who many of you might not know, he's gone now, but back in those, but when I was growing up, he had a relationship with Grace Methodist Church on State Street, where Sheridan Watson Bell was the reverend. And we, what, every year, our congregation would go and spend one cup with them, and then they would come up with us, and we did other things together. And I think those kinds of things, reaching out uh, for the Jewish people and uh, other religions to understand each other and where they're coming from and getting to know them, I think that's one thing that I love to see happen again, where churches and uh, temples and Jewish, the Jewish temples and the Muslim group, they would get together and they would eat together, have a lunch together, a dinner, and talk about each other. I think people, when they get to know each other and see what they're all about, I think that begins to, to go on the right path. Sabina? And then, uh, definitely, the onus is on the clergy. 
is on the religious people because they are the ones people trust the most. So they need to be standing there. I saw a universal universalist speak about Islam better than I could. So if she could preach that instead of Franklin Graham's and Pat Robertson and some of the Baptist ones that have a celebration of uh, burning the Quran, that's how we make a difference. It, the onus is definitely on faith, group, faith leaders, absolutely. Uh, I would just like to say that, um, Joyce, my reason for asking you to organize something like this right after the New Zealand terrorist attacks was that I wanted the message to go, go across that our fears are very real. The danger that we feel is very clear and present. The threat is real. Every waking moment that we spend, we feel hunted, we feel targeted. So you're saying people in our region, Muslims, yes, feel actual danger. Yes. yes. So what we need first and foremost, not just from faith leaders, but from the larger communities and, 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 and from those groups who do not have the same kind of threat hanging uh, on their head, to at least open up and recognize our fears as real, to acknowledge that yes, what you are fearing is actually real, is here, unlike what the president said when he was asked right after the New Zealand terrorist attacks whether he uh, saw white supremacy as a problem, and he said, no, I do not see it as a problem. It was just a few individuals and with few problems. Uh, so that trivializes or minimizes our experiences and our fears. So just open up first, and then when you open up, you will be able to have a dialogue. And that's where faith leaders come in. That's where, you know, we all can play a part uh, through faith. Uh, okay, to Mark, and then we'll together. let Bezad con conclude. Okay. As a Christian American <coughs> member of Western civilization, so to speak, uh, I, I have fear. I have great fear every day when I send my kids to school or when I go to a government building or any large public space, that there could be another Islamist, Islamist extremist terrorist attack in America. And we've had dozens and dozens over, of them over the past several years where three to four to 5,000 Americans were killed in these attacks. And I, mm -hmm. uh, 3,000 and 9 11. 11. Can you tell me uh, how many attacks have been perpetrated excuse by Muslims? Me, excuse yes. me. 3,000 and 9 11. San Bernardino, Orlando, Boston, the list goes on and on. And, and I and many people I know live in fear of another attack. And I'll tell you, I leave here tonight with less hope than I entered here tonight because I didn't hear any of my Muslim friends here condemn 9-11 and condemn the other terrorist oh attacks as motivated by religious intolerance against Christian America. So, Well, Mark, let's, let's give them, because I, I do think that is going a little far. All of, I know all of these people. They fully condemn terrorism. I didn't hear it. I, so, I, so we're going to give them yeah. an opportunity to do yeah. that so that you feel better. Okay, so yeah. go, so go down condemn, the line. We the have, so no, no, let's yes. just, just so, condemn. So why, why are we ask, I really protest that we are asking Please, Muslim people to apologize. We're having for a something. discussion. We are having I a discussion. No, I said was it was 9/11 motivated by religious intolerance okay, for, let against me a Christian right. America? But I no, mean, let me you answer you that. It wasn't. Let me. Let me. Whether I'm right or wrong, I don't even know what the okay, answer let is. Let me answer. I'm trying to answer. I'm trying to answer. We're going to stop it right now because we are not exhibiting civility. No, yes, that's and why. And civility means one person talks, yeah. one person does not talk over them, however motivated you are to object. Yeah. That's so self-control. It was not targeted exclusively against Christian America, okay? It was a multitude of things. First and foremost, it was the foreign policy that triggered it, the intervention in a lot of other countries that created economic and social 
problems for those countries and it was not something that happened overnight and they decided okay let's attack the the christian america well and let's not forget that a lot of muslim people also lost their lives in right. the attacks of 9 11. So and uh, now the case, yeah. you don't need to defend that. Yes, you really so, don't. But just I'm just trying to say that we have condemned multiple times. It has been 17, 17 years. It's just that our voices, the Muslim voices, the moderate Muslim voices who have condemned and who continue to condemn these um, incidents are not focused. They are not promoted. They are not portrayed in the media. We are portrayed in the media. So, okay. but what we are trying to say is we are targeted. We are a targeted group here. So the group that holds the power needs to engage in a dialogue with us and, and, and uh, reach out to us. Okay, can that we let Samia have that? Okay, yes. and then we'll go to that I, side. But I know a lot of people want to say something. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I truly understand your fear. I really do. Because we live in fear, too, so yes. I understand things. Exactly. And please believe me, we have all condemned it. Just Google. Yeah. and see how many Islam. And we condemn, all of us condemn any kind of Multiple terrorism, times, yes. whether it's done by a Muslim, which yeah. happens to be zero, 99.0.040s, 0. 1%. Yes. 0. 0.0001%. So am I to talk for them all the time? Yeah. It's not fair to put that on us. All kinds of terrorism are definitely... Including dead. white yes. nationalism. Absolutely. Yes. And I understand you. How do we get rid of that fear? Come talk to me. Yeah. Hold hands with me. Come on. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Because honestly, these these are all good people. Yeah. Absolutely. You're a good person. She's a good person. The only thing that separates you is you're not knowing that, yeah. not I understanding try. each other. Because there is no way these folks support Absolutely. anything that would hurt you. Absolutely. I want to thank each one of you. Look, these are tough topics, and they do rile us up. A deep inside so I understand why we got a little emotional but I thank you for doing your best to have a civil discussion I thank you Mark for being here to offer a different point of view because most of these folks seem to be going after you but we need, we need differences of opinion we need to come together with people who can help us at least understand what the other side is talking about